where I am joined this morning by Tom McHugh, who's uh, the Assistant Director of Admission at Holy Cross. Uh, Holy Cross is one of our great partner schools, and uh, we have a lot of their views on mission are very aligned to CM, and so we have a lot of guys who end up going to Holy Cross. One of my favorite things about Holy Cross is for many of our CM alums who end up there, there's like a lunch group that meets once a week on campus, and they all, uh, you know, whether they're freshmen to seniors at Holy Cross, they all kind of sit down together, they talk about CM, uh, and there's sort of like a, a knit group inside of that community to, uh, to pull it together. So some of the things we're gonna talk about this morning regarding community and feel and fit are all gonna be very similar to probably what you experienced when you were looking and selecting CM as a school. Um, that's one of the reasons I asked Tom to join us this morning is I think uh, the way that they approach admissions and the way that we talk about admissions in our office are pretty well aligned. And no matter where you are and looking at some of the families coming into this call, we have parents of eighth graders, ninth graders, 10th graders, I think a few 11th graders are here. Um, there's going to be a range of information here. Some of it might apply to exactly where you are in the process. Some of it might be a little bit different from your son's part. It's all fine. And so this is, if you're an 11th grade parent, you've probably heard some of this stuff before, but if this is your first time hearing anything, and if you want us to clarify something, you can obviously use the chat box. We're also gonna have some time at the end for a Q&A if you have a direct question about something that we don't cover. Uh, so first of all, Tom, welcome. Great to see you. Thanks so much for having me, Jack. It's good to see you as always. Always. Uh, and I think like maybe just the best place to get started as we think big picture about this process and advising parents who might be at the beginning of the college exploration process with their sons is, you know, it can feel very big and we want to shrink it down to just our family and how we approach those things. Do you have any in your experience working with students, working with families, what are some ways that a family might develop a plan about how to talk about college, not necessarily going to college itself, but just having conversations that are positive and holistic and moving things forward uh, with some goals in mind? I think that is a great place to start, um, just to set some parameters for the conversation and talk about more of the, the why uh, than the what. Uh, and I think that is one of my pieces of advice is for families as, as best as they can is to block out the outside noise, just because I, I think conversations in the grocery store at you know soccer game sidelines, that's where the pressure so sometimes starts to mount as you're thinking about um, where the Joneses are thinking about sending their kids and the bumper stickers that you might have on your car. Um, this is certainly an exciting, it should be an exciting time. Um, I do my best to avoid the word process because that just makes college search seem mechanical and uh, necessary where it is just a time, uh, a time in your son's life to think about where do I want to be um, after CM? Where do I see myself thriving and being surrounded by like-minded people? Um, so ultimately this is just an extension uh, of you know, what you've been experiencing at CM and um, we, we do want you to feel excited about it and not that this is anything uh, to dread necessarily. So I would say one piece of advice that I've spoken with colleagues about is designating places in your house uh, that you can talk about college. That um, we've even joked that we should get entire high schools to sign a pact <clears throat> where students aren't allowed to talk about what colleges they're looking at or applying to or thinking about um, they can say, I've signed this, I've signed this pact and I'm not allowed to answer your questions. But I think for families, maybe demarking places in the house at the kitchen table, um, we can talk about college, but you can't bombard me with questions in my room or in the car, just making a place to say, this is where we're going to get into the nuts and bolts, but I just don't want this to be hovering over my head for the next two, three, four, five years. Um, this idea of where are you going to go to school? That's such a loaded question. And for people outside of the family, you don't always know uh, kind of their motives or what they're gonna think about what you say. Um, so just within, you know, within your nuclear family, this is a decision that is between the son and the parents and maybe you know, a close circle, but ultimately this is your own college search. It's no one else's, so you get to own it. Um, and just remembering um, 
despite all of the deadlines and stress that this ultimately does cause for many families, that this is an exciting time. Um, there are ways to get from point A to point B, but I think having fun with it as much as possible, uh, knowing that there are people like Jack and the College Counseling Office at CM, as well as human beings like me in the admission office that are passionate about um, college access and fit, and we're here to help. Um, so I think these are all ways to think about the search process, but make sure um, that you do remember kind of what the ultimate goal here is, is to help your son land in a place where he feels supported and that it's, you know, I think you never want to be in a room where um, you're necessarily the smartest person or the least smart person. I think you want to be surrounded by uh, a peer group that's going to challenge you, but that also, that ultimately feels like uh, the, the academic fit, the social fit is there. And that comes with seeing some college campuses, which we'll get back to soon. Um, but hopefully those pieces of advice give some help and assistance to wh wherever you are uh, here today. And I think some other nuggets of truth will hopefully um, continue to unearth as me and Jack continue talking. And I, I really love that point about, you know, creating the space for it, because what can happen very naturally and from a very well-meaning place is you're at a family barbecue on July 4th weekend and Uncle Marty is interested in what's going on with your son and is trying to have a very pleasant and well-meaning conversation. And it gets loaded. And then I think there's a little bit of a responsibility on us as adults, and this could even be part of that pact that you make as a family, that if Uncle Marty is saying something to you as a parent, and like we don't want to have those moments in the car right home afterwards where it's, why haven't you this? Or why haven't you done this? Like, we want to, we never want to be approaching these conversations from a deficit of what haven't we done? And I just bumped into someone at the grocery store. Well, not bumped because we're six feet apart, but uh, you know, and they, they had this idea about college. Why aren't you doing this? We want to sort of take those moments, process them, and then wherever that space is to have the conversations where everyone feels like they know what that conversation is going to be to move forward with it. So dang uncle Marty, uncle Marty, every time, uh, but in, in, you know, thinking about those conversations that we might have with uncle Marty or the other people in our life, sometimes we, you know, especially at this time of year, we're starting to think about courses and what courses you're taking for next year. Uh, and one question that you might be considering as a parent is, you know, where does, course rigor sort of fit into this. So Tom, could you talk a little bit, how does Holy Cross view the difference between maybe a college prep class or an honors class? How does AP factor into everything, weighted grades, all that stuff? How do you view course rigor? Before I jump into that, I'll just add one addendum to our last answer and then I'll go right into course rigor. But um, I just wanted to follow up on a point that you made um, of not approaching this ever from a deficit because ultimately when you think about all of the college and university options that are out there for you in the United States, there's thousands, thousands of schools yeah. like that. So there's no way you can ever completely like know everything about. Um, Neither does Uncle Marty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, except for Uncle Marty, he knows everything. Um, but yeah, just knowing that there's never a way to completely wrap your arms around everything. And there's always gonna be other people out there that have specific, um, areas of knowledge that might be a gap in yours, but that's okay because um, also another thing is I think there's great fits and there's good fits. You know, there, there are schools um, that are, are gonna end up kind of rising, uh, rising up as time goes by as a, a solid fit for your son. Um, and they can be happy in multiple places. There's no, uh, there's no soulmate college necessarily. There's, um, there are a lot of good places and, and factors um, will make themselves known as time goes by. But um, this is a, a question that's certainly uh, a big topic of discussion in college counseling offices and admission offices. I think it's one of the, uh, the biggest pieces as high school students are planning for their four years at CM and beyond and how that's going to be viewed. Um, this is gonna take a little while to kind of delve into everything, but because I, I do wanna be transparent and honest about rigor, um, but also uh, kind of 
give you action items and, and reasonable steps to think about course selection. So um, this is another thing that also kind of corresponds with what types of colleges you're looking at. And I think, um, or thinking about at least, uh, within the high school setting, you want to take classes that are appropriately challenging. Um, you want to be similar to the colleges that I was talking about uh, where students should be. You want to be surrounded by a peer group uh, that's pretty much on the same page where you're learning at the same level, you're as interested in the subject matter, and you have a teacher that's ready to support you and challenge you and your peer group um, to, to the level that you're ready for. So it would not be a good idea for a student necessarily to feel like they're jumping in in over their head and taking on more than they can because that's ultimately counterproductive if um, if they're getting bad grades in hard classes, that's um, not gonna put them in a position of power or authority in the college application, um, no matter where they're applying. So you do kind of want to, I think for many students, dip your toe in the water in the first and second year. Um, as a college admission officer, I, I do look for growth. Um, I, I do look for a student, um, it, it kind of depends where you start too. If you're in all college prep classes to begin and you do well your first year, then going into your second year, thinking about taking a couple of honors classes. Um, and I know that CM has some exciting options and, and a lot of rigor um, that's made available and you can't, you can't ultimately take on everything. Um, but you also do want to factor in areas of interest as well. Uh, I know as we were kind of having our planning conversations, Jack, we were talking about how electives factor in. Mm -hmm. And you don't necessarily, um, if you are applying to highly selective schools, you can't always just load up on classes that you're interested in. I think part of college is diving into that, su that subject matter at a deeper level. But I would definitely encourage students um, during their, you know, I think junior and senior year is when you have more opportunities to take on electives to take an economics class or an engineering class. Um, not even if it doesn't have a designation of honors or AP or anything like that, um, but it's just something that you think is going, ultimately going to help you discern your path, um, then, then take that on because it might help you choose what college or university or what major you might ultimately be thinking in. So um, one other thing that I'd, I'd like to add is, well, the college application itself does seem kind of formulaic and difficult <clears throat> difficult to tweak. There are a number of opportunities as you're applying to colleges or thinking about um, applying to colleges to give some context to your thought process. A uh, school like Holy Cross has admission interviews and the common application itself has an area that's titled additional information. And both of these places are great opportunities to talk directly to college admission offices, just to say, um, you might be wondering why I went this route with my course selection. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to explain myself. This, this was my rationale in conversations with my parents and my counselor or based on my own volition. I decided to take this elective or I, um, you know, I decided to take these honors classes, whatever it might be. Um, so there are opportunities to kind of vouch and advocate for yourself and speak directly to us, which I think is something that a lot of students wisely take advantage of. Um, but I, I definitely would recommend really relying on the wisdom of counselors like Jack to guide you through um, what is an appropriate level of rigor, um, what is going to be enough, and what's too much. There's definitely a distinction there. And this isn't uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure to take on a ton of AP coursework, um, but you know, we still want you to, to be teenagers and have lives and be able to spend time with your parents and your friends and to involve yourself in extracurriculars. So approach, approach your planning with balance more than anything else. Um, I don't, you know, I, I do want to be transparent because uh, for selective colleges, rigor certainly does matter, but um, we do want you to enjoy your high school experience and not get to the finish line and, and think about graduation as like 
you're out of breath and you're totally done. Um, we want you to arrive on college campuses full of life and um, ready for learning and excited for the next four years. So um, if you feel like you're huffing and puffing throughout high school, um, it's okay if that happens sometimes, but that shouldn't be the totality of your experience. So um, do make sure that you get the chance to smell the flowers and enjoy time with your loved ones and that extra time that's not spent um, overdoing yourself is going to allow you to enjoy, um, you know, enjoy these years and find a better fit at the end, I think. And the question that we opened this with was why, right? I mean, that's what we want to be driving all of our decisions. And with the AP courses, sometimes there's a feeling of, I need to take an AP to take an AP. And uh, definitely, as Tom was saying, with some of the most selective colleges, yeah, you need, you need to take APs. But if you weren't recommended for an AP or you appeal and you don't get into an AP, there are other ways, especially sophomore, junior year, that you can demonstrate what you're doing. What I love about some of our science electives at CM, especially as you know, we're looking at the opening of the CIAL next year, uh, we're, we're in a moment where people kind of want to know what are you doing and what are you building or what are you creating? And we have some opportunities through project-based learning and remote learning right now where you can really, sometimes in those electives, you could have a project or you could create something that is unique to you that you could talk about in a rep visit where you're talking one-on-one -on -one with a rep or using that space on the Common App. So there's no... There's no like lost or wasted space, right? Like what, be where your feet are. If you're in elective courses, you can still have a meaningful experience in an elective. Uh, you might be recommended for an AP that sounds miserable to you. And it's okay not to take that. You don't have to take the AP just to have that AP. Like we really want those classes to reflect something that you care about. And I guess maybe Tom, as you think about, you mentioned a little bit, you know, looking at how a transcript might grow or change. Um, you know, we, we have a range of parents on the call. There's that kind of drumbeat that we always hear about junior year and junior year is the most important year. Junior year is the most important year. Um, it, someone who's in an admissions office, how do you look at freshman and sophomore year? Like how do those, you know, how do you look at the totality of a transcript? Because I, I have a feeling that you don't just look at one year and call it a day. You certainly do not. Um... And once again, I'll do the same thing just to add on to what you said. I can't just jump right into the question. I apologize. Oh, that's fine. Um, the one point uh, that I wanted to echo uh, that Jack said, be where your feet are, uh, control what you can control. And, you know, I think in this moment in time, uh, it's important to have agency and, and to control what you can control. And in your classes, whatever they are, if you are in that situation where you weren't recommended for a specific class that you wanted to get into, just knock the classes that you're in out of the park. A's are, are always going to be a good thing. So um, pour yourself uh, into the classes that you're in. And um, there, you know, there likely is a, a good reason um, for, for um, why you kind of are in the classes that you're in. Um, and I will say, uh, before jumping into the importance and the thoughts about freshman and sophomore year, the, the real reason I think that junior year uh, does have this huge level of import in terms of like the myth of high school is just that in college admission offices, junior year, um, like we're typically reading applications in November, December, and January of a student's senior year where um, many schools don't require senior grades. They don't need uh, those marks in order to make a decision. So junior year is the most recent information. So it makes sense that a college wants to know, like, what have you done for me lately? What is your profile looking like as of this moment? Um, but that's certainly not to, to discount all that you've done in high school. Um, and this is another thing that, uh, similar to uh, my previous answer, that I do want to be honest and transparent about the importance of freshman and sophomore year, but also not put any added pressure either. Like the college search, there should be balance. In our offices, there should be balance as well. So if your first and second year of high school brought difficulty and awkwardness and transition and change like it does for many, um, know that that's okay. And we are certainly ready to understand that. 
Um, it does take some time, especially for many students going to a new private high school or maybe they don't have a ton of friends and they're trying to find their social fit and also gain their standing as a student. Um, that it, you know, that first year might not be reflective of really who you are because I think high school is such a journey and you kind of do end up getting to your destination more quickly during junior and senior year oftentimes. So just know um, that we will understand if, you know, if there was some difficulties academically that those places that I talked about earlier, the interview and the additional information section, as well as the, um, the words that your counselors and teachers will say on your behalf, um, there, there is room for mistakes in high school. That certainly does happen. Um, and we are also equipped to understand concussions and mono and you know, extended illnesses, um, you know, situations in your family, mental health. Um, these are things that we also would like to know about for students that feel comfortable disclosing them um, because we don't want to hold you to the same standard of who you are during probably the most difficult moment during your high school journey. So that's kind of all of the the negative side of things in terms of like what could go wrong during those first couple of years and knowing that you should get a pass from most admission offices if there is a bump in the road. Um, but also knowing um, that they do matter. We, it's not as though we're just looking at a student's junior year. The transcript has all of your grades and we will be very interested to know um, how you did do during those first couple of years because I think ultimately the work that you do during your first and second year as a high school student informs and really um, can make a difference in the classes that you end up in during your final two years. So it certainly does matter. Um, we want, we would prefer to see um, good grades throughout, but we also understand that not all journeys are completely linear and that sometimes there are bumps in the road as, as opposed to just a completely upward trajectory. So um, be easy on yourself, especially for those students that are um, you know, first and second year students right now, there's going to be a massive asterisk on the spring semester of 2020. All college admission offices are going to know that this was not normal. And um, for the next four years, as we're reading applications, I think we'll be um, considering distance learning with a grain of salt. Um, so, you know, we are equipped to, to handle uh, difficulties. We're, we're trained for that. But um, you know, certainly put your best foot forward as much as possible and um, also use the resources that are, are available to you with um, supports that your teachers offer and, and the guidance that your parents are, are ready to offer as well. And I mean, it's, it's worth repeating as we're talking to Tom right now. Tom is a human being who reads the, these transcripts and reads applications. You know, I mean, I think when we kind of remove the stigma of what the application process looks like and we don't have a tower where people are crossing names off a list and saying, no, 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 no. We've got Tom saying, okay, let's see how this student grew. That's an important way to remember how our transcript reads and what it says about us. And, you know, I think what Tom brought up was a, a really interesting point as well, which is, uh, you know, there are some students, maybe you do have straight A's throughout high school and you're starting off strong and you're taking APs as a sophomore. And then you have that one B plus that it just feels like it's haunting you. I'm going to tell you right now, people have written great essays about those B pluses, you know, college, college essays. Um, you can have more than anything, we want to demonstrate growth and growth often happens through a little bit of discomfort. And so having a bump in the road sometimes proves to be a good thing in the long run, as long as we're approaching that bump as we're keeping it right sized and, you know, we have a lot of other things going on right now. If you have a B plus in one of your freshman classes, the world's going to keep on spinning, you know, um, and, and sort of just like, what, what are you taking away from that? What are you learning from it? Yeah, there's even opportunities. I often, this is getting to the end of applying to college. And I know that's not really where we're at today um, with the group that we're speaking to, but I often advise students as they're progressing into their uh, junior and senior years and thinking about teachers that might write them letters of recommendation to actually select the teacher that they received maybe the lowest grade in high school in, um, as long as that was a class that you, you know, busted your tail in and really worked hard in. Because hearing from a teacher where you got an A in, um, they're going to shower you with 
um, understandable compliments and a number of adjectives that are glowing. Um, but to hear from a teacher, um, we're going to have questions about that class regardless. Um, whether that's a straight A student that has a B plus, I, I guess some offices might wonder, I wonder why that, that subject presented a unique challenge or it's a student um, that you know, has A's and B's and has one C on their transcript. I wonder you know, why that class um, ended up being so difficult for this student. We're gonna have questions anyway. So to hear from a, a teacher that said, um, this subject did not come easy to this student, but throughout the entirety of the year, they really worked. Um, they came for extra help. These are advocacy and persistence are such important qualities in college students and just in young men and women uh, in general. So hearing that directly from a teacher in a class that we would already be thinking about what happened there um, can be a powerful tool and something that maybe some students might not think of. It doesn't necessarily have to come from your favorite teacher or your easiest subject, but sometimes the opposite, the teacher that uh, was a, a thorn in your side, but you you really continued to work from day one and should be proud of the mark that you ended up with. It, in my teaching days, before making the transition over, the easiest letter I ever wrote was for a kid who, I think he finished my the, the year in my English class with a B minus, but I had a revision <laughs> policy for every essay that was optional. You could revise as many times as you wanted. Huh. This kid was revising four or five times. He would meet with me every day after school. I mean, that's an easy letter to write because, I mean, that, that's work ethic with proof right there, you know? So thinking about, okay, well, what is, what's the big picture of this course is a good way to approach it. And, you know, you also brought up spring semester of 2020 and, you know, this, this whole moment um, with, as students are kind of projecting forward and thinking about those conversations that we might be having as a family right now, what, might students be learning about themselves? What might parents be learning about their sons, you know, as a result of distance learning? And how could they apply some of those lessons to the college search team? Yeah, I, I would say um, if, if distance learning has come with no challenges at all, you feel like you're well equipped uh, to kind of self-educate and do a lot of independent work, then a massive research university probably could be a, a pretty solid fit. Just thinking about class sizes and supports that are in places, um, a school like Holy Cross that I represent is much more known for small seminar classes. And I would say that's the case with most liberal arts colleges like Holy Cross. Um, so this doesn't, this current situation in semester shouldn't dictate your entire college search but should inform a little bit about who you are as a learner. Um, if you feel as though you actually like this um, ability to kind of have lecture and then do independent research and, and do your own work, um, then I would say you know, a large university, a state school um, could ultimately be a great fit for you, um, that you feel like you are someone that uh, thrives in this situation and, and prefers not to have to um, enter into discussion all the time. Um, on the flip side, if this has been a very unwelcome transition and you feel like you're not getting the support that you're used to and you miss the community and the ability to sit down and, and get to know your peer group and your teacher very well, then thinking, kind of setting your sights on <clears throat> an institution that mirrors those qualities a little bit more. And I also advise students, a, a point that you brought up, Jack, at the beginning, that you feel as though Holy Cross, our admission process, mirrors the work that you do in the counseling office. <clears throat> I also advise students um, to apply to schools that you feel like um, the qualities that you value are mirrored in their admission process as well. Um, if you are someone that feels comfortable <clears throat> with kind of data-driven, like just metrics of AP courses and test scores, um, and that is really the, the leader in a, a college or university's admission process, um, then you know, that's one thing. But if you do really like, want to be seen as an individual, as a human being with the opportunity to interview and tell your story and get to have this one-on-one -on -one connection, then that is kind of another set of schools and, and offices as well. And um, the counseling staff at CM can certainly uh, shed some light on that, but I think that is an, an important distinction. If you feel as though your values aren't being met 
just within the admission process, then that might be an indication of like what the experience might be as a student for the next four years. And I keep advising parents during this time and students during this time, one way you can get, begin to get a sense of that is, I mean, colleges have their mission statement right up there in front for everyone to see on the about page. And, you know, we talk a lot about mission at Catholic Memorial, colleges, Holy Cross, I have a feeling, Tom, that you've probably had one or two conversations about mission. You know, it's, uh, it, it's where does that mission fit and what is, how are they articulating their values and how do those values match, match your own? And as we're in this moment, if you're someone who is struggling with community, you are one of those people who, who thrives on community and like many of our students do, which is one of the reasons you're at CM, you know, the, the spring of 2020 has been a blur for everybody, right? I mean, we're, we're kind of at the end right now where we're just catching our breath. Um, as we look forward to what next school year looks like, and there's still a lot of unknowns there for, for everybody on the college side and the high school side, but, you know, as we catch our breath over the summer, what are some of the things that you miss that maybe we're going to find ways to create in whatever that space may look like? And I think some of that creativity to demonstrate again, what are the things you do? What are the what have you built? What have you created? Um, and creating community in a space where community can feel awkward. I mean that that's a way of sort of articulating your own personal mission and values. Those mission statements, I can assure you that each word is very carefully selected, and they're usually not too long to read. So I think that is a great jumping off point as you're thinking about different colleges and universities out there. What what do these places stand for? What are they ultimately trying to get at and produce um, from their pupils and their alumni? So I think that can be kind of, it's not the be all end all, but um, those, those statements are very carefully crafted and, and should kind of give you a pretty solid sense of what this school is all about. So I think that is a good place to start for, for a lot of families. And so maybe like at, at this moment, we can take it a little bit from the intangible of mission, which is such a, a huge idea. And if we want to get down to, to brass tacks and, you know, the, the how of some of these things, um, standardized testing, especially, you know, if, if you're a parent of an eighth grader, ninth grader, 10th grader, um, 11th grader, like the, the landscape has shifted so drastically in the past three months. Um, could you talk a little bit, how do you view Holy Cross, you know, how, how will you be measuring or evaluating the SAT and ACT moving forward? You are a test optional school. Is test optional really test optional? The age-old question. Uh, you know how how do you see testing being a factor, not just in the next cycle, but maybe over the next three or four years? I do feel fortunate to work for a college that's been test optional for quite some time. I this is my going on fourth year in the office, and Holy Cross has been test optional since two thousand and five. So I think I was in seventh grade when that happened. So they've been doing it for. You know, they've been doing it for a long time. Um, and I appreciate uh, our optional policy and, and other colleges and universities jumping on board with the, the notion of test optional because it puts the power back into the hands of the student in my eyes. It allows um, applicants to focus on strengths and not have to dwell on any potential weaknesses or, or pressure points. Um, I, I like to think of it as um, getting the, the good news about test optional policies out there so that as a student is sitting down and racked with anxiety and nerves on, on the test day, which is hard to imagine right now, um, everyone's sitting so close together filling out their scantrons, but it'll come back at some point, um, that you should know whatever that score ends up being that does not dictate your future successes and your path in life. Um, each day, there are more schools that are jumping on board with the notion that there are inequities baked into standardized testing and is not a fair and equitable process for, for all applicants. So um, I also think that it's important to know if you're going for a specific number, um, taking the test four, five, six times, in my eyes, is not a, a good use of your time, whereas you could be doing all of the things that I mentioned earlier, spending time with loved ones, um, pursuing passion projects, reading a book, things that you actually might enjoy doing more than preparing for standardized testing, which um, I don't think anyone really enjoys all that much. It's more of just 
uh, a, a hurdle to clear. So um, whatever that number is, I mean, standardized testing still can open doors for some students and um, might be a ticket into places, but uh, I do think that more colleges are, are going to be uh, jumping on board with this as time goes by. And I certainly um, am only equipped to speak for the institution that I represent. Um, but I will say in speaking with colleagues, test optional really is test optional, especially at Holy Cross. Um, first, about a third of our students who are currently on campus right now never sent us any SAT or ACT information and we felt completely comfortable evaluating who they are as a student and as a person with the other materials. So their application was considered a full puzzle without any missing pieces. And we didn't assume that they never took the test or that they did poorly. It doesn't affect our admission rates uh, for students that don't submit scores. It doesn't affect any financial aid or merit scholarships. We really just want students to be able to submit things that they feel as though um, are their best work and, and positions of, you know, putting them in positions of power as opposed to, you know, making them feel bad about some arbitrary number that no one's going to remember four years from now. Um, we also, the initial reason that Holy Cross went test optional, and I've heard this from other colleges as well, is that in the early aughts from like 2000 to 2005, we gathered data on our student body and did some research on the students that submitted high test scores in admissions versus those who were kind of on the lower end of the test spectrum. And the difference in GPA was 0.01. It, it didn't exist. There, for Holy Cross students, the qualities that mattered more were work ethic and persistence and self-advocacy as opposed to just natural test-taking ability. We're such a writing and presentation-driven school. Um, those are you know, people that want to be at our, our place um, and you know, are willing to work and are passionate about their subject matter, those are going to, to rule the day as opposed to um, you know, a, a 33 on an ACT or something like that. So um, certainly we encourage students um, when, tests, when testing comes back up to take the test because we know that you know, not every school is test optional. Um, so if you have the ability to you know, take it once or twice, uh, go for it. But just know that it does not determine your, uh, how great you are or your, your place within the school. And it should not be another one of these kind of bumper sticker um, conversations. Like as don't feel pressure to share your score with friends or anything like that. Um, you can tell them, Tom from Holy Cross that it's none of your business. And just to clarify and, and to confirm for everybody, you never see PSAT scores, correct? No, no, never seen. Never ever. So on my own. If, you, if you, so if you bomb the test in eighth grade or ninth grade or 10th Doesn't grade, matter. nobody it, like practice it. We're talking about practice, right? Now. So it's, uh, yeah, don't, so don't, I think one of the, the big takeaways is we're getting close to the end of the conversation now and, um, definitely, if you if you have questions, we haven't an answered, and you want to add something to the chat box or raise your hand, you can do that. We, we kind of have one more, but the focus on program and what you do in the classroom and what you do in your extracurriculars can say so much more than you than what that number is. And I, I mean, I for one, I'm very happy to see. I, I wish it didn't take a pandemic to move the needle like this, but same here with the move to more and more test optional schools. I think there's a better and more authentic representation of who students are. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll bring it maybe as, as we close a little bit of our back and forth, Tom, bring it back to our friend, Uncle Marty here, who's, you know, again, a, a well-meaning guy. Uh, but as we're, as we're thinking about these conversations that could happen, that could be well-meaning, um, and we think about program and academics, sometimes the, the go-to question for anyone is like, well, what do you want to major in? Which for an adult can sometimes feel like a basic question that, that's right there. But then if you're a 15 year old kid, it's a loaded question that also means, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? Yeah. Um, so rather than asking that question, which can feel a loaded question as a parent to your son, what are, what are things that parents might observe in their son? Um, what are some of the conversations that could happen that might lead more towards fit rather than towards, okay, you like, 
math, let's find a great math school. Uh, this is this is a big one. It's another loaded question. What do you want to major in? What do you want to spend the next seventy years doing? Like, um, that's a lot. Because people never switch majors. Yeah, no, that's never happened. Um, whatever you say, whatever, however you answer that question, you're locked into. You have to major in that. Um, I, I will just start by saying one thing that I appreciate about Holy Cross and schools of the like is that all, regardless of what students put on their college application, all of our students are required to start out as undeclared. So even if you have a definitive path, you answered that question and said, I'm gonna be an English major and are bound by legal contract to then major in that, um, you are, you know, you have time and, and the ability um, to approach your college experience with openness and flexibility. Um, there are a number of students at Holy Cross that take a new subject or revisit an old one and because of you know their peer group or their professor a new spark is um, kind of uh, brought up in them and uh, you know they end up changing their path and, and others will stick to it um, but also whatever you major in in college doesn't always dictate what your career looks like um, that you're not signing up for a job you're signing up for you know the major fo focus of your undergraduate study but um, there are a lot of people that are in professions now that um, you know that's not what they majored in, in college dr anthony fauci is a uh, yeah yeah <laughs> he's a holy cross grad and he was a classics major at, at holy cross and went on to, to medical school so um what however you might answer that question that uncle marty asked um or whatever you major in in college doesn't always dictate your path it certainly can um, there are very career oriented um, majors and programs of study, but it certainly does not have to. And I think that there's some beauty in that as well. Um, as we are thinking about other questions that people might be able to ask or topics that you might be able to consider when thinking about major, I think it all comes back to this same conversation of, of fit and balance and happiness. Um, what is it that you enjoy doing? Um, what uh, to quote Marie Kondo, the, the Netflix clean lady, um, you know, what brings you joy? Uh, do, you, do you see your son really taking to reading and writing? And do you feel as though something in the humanities is, is going to be um, the best fit? Or, you know, has your son always been more of a, an analytical type who enjoys working on research projects or? Um, working on data sets, and also these things can evolve over time as well. Um, those are kind of the two major buckets, I would say, but there's a, a whole lot of subjects within the social sciences that combine the two of these. Um, and, and then also, you know, what are you involved in or what do you enjoy spending your free time doing, um, whether that's kind of independent projects that you, you're working on at home, you know, delving into a book, working in the community, um, concerning yourself with service and social justice um, there you know you you don't have to have an answer uh, to the question of, of what you're going to major in and there can be multiple combinations and, and iterations of this as time goes by um, but i do think that is that is one thing to consider moving forward is um, as as i've grown up and evolved what are the, some of the things that i enjoy pouring myself into what what makes me lose track of time um, and, and, you know, I know in my own life, I, I didn't always have a definitive answer to that question. One year it would be one thing and another year it would be another thing. So giving yourself uh, permission to change and evolve and um, to learn more about yourself as time goes by. So especially if you're 14, 15 years of age, don't feel like you have to um, have a definitive answer to that question. Um, but do, you know, do think, especially in this moment where we have the ability to be thoughtful and reflective and kind of have alone time. What is it that I would love to be doing with, you know, with some chunk of my life? What, what do I enjoy studying or learning about? Um, kind of doing research on potential career paths and, um, you know, speaking with people in your own community about the work that they do. Someone's in, you know, banking or architecture, just, Having these exploratory conversations, I think having mentors and advisors is such an important part I know in, in my own life. 
has really um, led me into you know some specific uh, academic and, and uh, professional decisions. So relying on the people around you who are uh, who are in those kind of uh, lines of work might be illuminating. And I think what is really interesting about this moment that we're in as well is there, there's also this feeling of loss a little bit of, you know, what are the things that you miss doing? You know, are mm -hmm. you a great chemistry student who all of a sudden your grades are going down because you're not in the lab and doing chemistry on your kitchen table isn't the same thing? Or are you a, you know, like, like Tom was saying, are you in English or history? Are you doing more research projects now because you're working independently and you really enjoy that research? You, you know, I mean, what has, what has kind of changed to say, all right, this, I never thought that subject A could look like X and trying to fill in those and say, well, I kind of like X or I really miss A, you know, and, and having those conversations of, you know, what has gotten better with distance learning and what has gotten more difficult and what has gotten more challenging or, or what do you miss the most about those things um, can be great conversations. I will just say also in, um, in defense of the humanities, I think for a lot of, a lot of families and parents, understandably with the cost of college, families are concerned with outcomes and career guarantees and things like that. Um, but just that, um, I think the age-old question with English and history and philosophy majors is like, how are you going to apply this undergraduate degree to the real world? And <clears throat> Holy Cross and, and a lot of other colleges <clears throat> have added these career-oriented tracks that don't correspond necessarily with classes that you take, but can be a different lens that you look through. So, for instance, we have uh, pre-business and pre-law and pre-health professions and uh, teaching education as well. So um, if, if you're passionate about the English and history projects that you're working on, you can certainly think about having that be central to your college experience still, while also um, appeasing um, parents and, and also pursuing a, a different area that's going to help you fit into the prof professional world. So just wanted to add that as a, an English major um, who did the pre-business track that um, you know there are there are ways to combine things. You don't just have to be one particular subject uh, as something that defines you. And with that, that's sort of the, the prepared portion of the conversation. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, if, you, if you have any questions that you wanna raise your hand and, and say it out loud, or if you wanna add something to the chat box, by all means, come on in. I just finished my cup of coffee. Oh, I downed mine a while ago. Ah, oh, shoot. I paced myself. <laughs> if you type in the chat box or something right now, something I can share with, with everyone. If you're a freshman parent, uh, later on today, we're gonna be sending an invite for SCORE. Uh, S-C-O-I-R, which is our um, college research tool. So if you want to start exploring a little bit over the summer, it'll have information about CM grads and um, acceptance rates and things like that, as well as virtual tours of schools. Like Tom said, hopefully we'll be able to visit campuses again soon. Um, have you had any conversations, Tom, about when those visits might be able to happen again in person? Great question. Um, and it looks like the, the next question was in a similar vein, which is, um, I'll, I'll knock two birds out with one stone here. <clears throat> in terms of official dictates, um, the college is currently closed to visitors until August 1st. So that's the most official thing that I can report at this time. It's impossible for me to envision um, late September welcoming 2,000 guests for an open house. Um, I, I just can't foresee that possibly happening. But I certainly, I oversee the tour guide program at Holy Cross and I do hope that uh, come late summer, early fall, uh, that we're at a place in society where we are able to welcome small groups of guests. I think I might have more work for my tour guides in that they're not gonna be able to lead around a group of 20 people, but they might be able to lead around 
one family at a time from a safe distance. Um, so they might have to give, you know, three tours a week as opposed to one. Uh, so I think there's going to be modifications and it's not going to be the exact same. Some might be, some of it might be better. Some of it might be worse or different. Um, but I, I don't have any inside knowledge necessarily. Um, um, our <clears throat> administration has said they're going to pass along uh, information about our plan for the fall semester uh, in early July. It's one of these difficult situations where other colleges are kind of announcing their plans or at least like releasing uh, little press snippets to say like, this is what we're thinking about doing. Holy Cross is just kind of um, staying pat, which in, in many ways I appreciate because I think the longer we are able to wait, the better and more informed decision we're ultimately going to be able to make. Um, but it is tough to, to just be waiting on pins and needles to hear exactly what the plan is going to be. So I think by July, you know, right after July 4th, that I'll probably be able to answer these questions more definitively. But um, I, I do expect in some way um, that we'll be able to, to welcome visitors this fall. But I also um, recognize, like, I'm not going to be able to do my normal job. I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to visit CM this fall. Um, you know, as a visitor coming into your enclosed school building, going from high school to high school, that, that seems unrealistic as well. Just contact tracing at that point would be pretty tough. Um, but with tours on a nice day that are uh, outside where people can remain distance, I, I'd like to think that that might be a little bit more possible. Um, virtual tours are certainly available on most college websites, Holy Cross included. And for, especially for the colleges that are farther away, you know, if you're looking at schools in California or Texas or Illinois, um, and that seems really difficult to think about getting to those campuses, that at least gives you a picture of what the, the campus itself looks like. Um, it, it certainly is missing the student life component and the human connection that you would experience on a normal student tour. Um, but that might be a good place to start for now, just to add schools or cross schools off your list. Um, but for Holy Cross, um, we'll, we'll be up and running um, as soon as we can and, and are definitely looking forward to welcoming people back to the Hill. And Tom, I just had a great question come through uh, sort of directly to me. And I, I would love to touch on this because we've talked a lot about um, connection in, in a place like Holy Cross that uh, gets to know the whole student and, and we sort of factor in their story. Uh, you, you know, typically kind of sophomore year to junior year, there's a little bit of, I don't necessarily want to tr say training, but prep and conversations happening in theology classes and our Beyond CM program about interviewing and, you know, what it's like to talk to a rep and how to prepare for that. But we've lost some of that now. And um, a very reasonable thing that some students might be feeling is, some social anxiety or they might be feeling nervous about those conversations mm. so if a student does feel like nervous in those moments or feels that an interview might hurt them can interviews hurt a student um is there a way like can you bomb an interview basically and, and ruin your chances we would never ever um view an interview as a negative conversation if a student is nervous or shy um, that is never going to be something that we walk away and, and think that person's not a good fit for Holy Cross because they were nervous in their interview. Every, everyone, everyone's nervous in the interview. And when I, as a, a counselor, um, kind of recognize that a student has brought a good amount of nerves and might not be fully themselves, um, I try to do a good amount of the talking for the first five minutes so a student can catch their breath and, um, and ask some real layup questions to begin with. Um, if a student's coming in, uh, just thinking about last year, if, if I'm interviewing a student in August, just talking about what they did over the summer, um, you know, thinking about what is it that they enjoy doing, just because I think that can often get the conversation off on a better foot than starting off with um, academic and you know more um, nuts and bolts questions. So we as counselors and, and representatives of the college, we want you to, to put your best foot forward in these interviews. We are, um, especially at a school like Holy Cross, are just trying to set you up for success and giving, asking you the right questions to tell your story. Um, and while these admission interviews might seem more geared towards the extroverted, 
student government types. And, and, you know, maybe those students come in more comfortable. Honestly, and truly, some of my favorite conversations are um, over, over my three years at Holy Cross have been with students that take a little bit of time to warm up that are clearly more on the introverted and shy side, um, but have so much depth to them and um, end up, you know, saying such profound things as the interview goes along. So um, these interviews are not intended to cater to one specific personality type. Um, they, for anyone that is brave and bold enough to, to take advantage of these interviews, and I hope that that's you, um, they are just a great chance to have a conversation and uh, to get to know someone from the school better, especially someone that, you know, might actually get to be reading your application. Um, it's much more difficult for us to say no to students that we've met along the way, that we've formed a, a bond with, that we like, as opposed to kind of a name on a piece of paper that we're not familiar with. Um, so, you know, the social anxiety piece is completely understandable and know that, you know, you're, you're not alone in that, but that is going to be kind of a shared experience. And um, we as counselors are, are trained and ready uh, to handle your son with care and, um, you know, to, um, to ask questions that uh, set them up for success in the interview as opposed to adding additional pressure. I, I, I think that's, that's wonderful. And I'm, I think that's a great place to end, especially, you know, as we've been saying all along, admissions offices are filled with people like Tom who are, who are trying to find ways to say yes. They're not the great arbiters of, of entrance with a red pen and looking for reasons to say no. Um, and if your son is in that place, especially if he's a current junior going into senior year or sophomore going into junior year, and you feel like there's going to be more of those opportunities next year, all of the counselors on the CM staff do mock interviews that we sort of give you some prep questions. We'll tell you what those softballs are going to be before they get to you. Um, so again, engage with your counselor, share like, Hey, I, I think having that transparency and saying, this is something I'm concerned about. Uh, I'm afraid for this moment. I'm afraid for this interview. Um, everyone wants to support you and make you feel as successful and as confident as possible. And I'll also say, I've seen plenty of student government types who are, you know, very confident in a lot of other realms walk in and all of a sudden they've got sweaty palms and they, you know, they're catching their breath. It's, it, you know, 16, 17 year old high school boys will be like, no, no, I got it. I don't, I mean, everyone can benefit from a little bit of interview prep and a little bit of practice. So anytime you want to ask for it, we're always there to help. And on that note, Tom, I want to say thank you so much for joining us. If your son is a sophomore or junior, Tom's going to be back at 2.30 for an admissions rep visit to talk about Holy Cross and a little bit of the admissions process, more specific to that, and that is more student focused. Uh, like I said, if you're a, currently the parent of a freshman, we'll be sending along uh, registration info for SCORE later today so that you can sign up. But I want to say a big thank you to Tom McHugh and Holy Cross. Have a great day, everyone. And if there's anything we can do, by all means, reach out to your counselor.